is already an a critically acclaimed author with Tomatoes in My Lunchbox, her debut picture book. It has been well received and has a starred review by Kirkus. She was born in the UK, just like my parents, and spent her early years in London. She now lives among the olive trees in a hot, dusty village in Cyprus with her family and dogs. She's worked with art, literature, and young people in various professional capacities with several organizations, including Fulbright, Amidace, and Bold Leaders. Magdalena is an award-winning Minneapolis-based illustrator and graphic designer with a special interest in children's books and visual storytelling. She's illustrated several picture books, including um, Deborah Dyson's Equality's Call. When she's not drawing, she enjoys wandering around the Twin Cities, usually in search of the perfect taco. Today, we celebrate their beautiful picture book, Tomatoes in My Lunchbox. In it, we find the story of a name. A young student deals with the first day of school after moving from another country. Uh, after feeling lonely and like she doesn't fit in, she begins to feel a growing sense of joy as she makes new friends and embraces her identity. And now I'm excited to turn it over um, to our author and illustrator. Welcome. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you for that lovely introduction. It's really lovely to be here today. I'm very, very honored and delighted to be spending the afternoon with you. It's afternoon for me. I'm, here, I'm in Cyprus, so it's 5 p.m. here. Um, I'll read the book, but just before I start reading the book, I'd just like to give a little bit of context, a little bit of background, so that while I'm reading, maybe some things will slot into place or maybe some questions will come up. Um, as you heard in the intro, I live in Cyprus. I was born in the UK, so I come from kind of a mixed background. Um, the story is um, based loosely on my own experiences, but layered with experiences of um, family and friends and students. Um, and it's a story of, of feeling different. It's a story about somebody, a, a young girl who feels different, who feels a little bit out of place. And this manifests most obviously with the pronunciation of her name. My name is not the easiest name to pronounce. Uh, in Greek, it's Kostandia. In English, I have heard all sorts of versions. Um, so this is kind of the background of the story. Uh, I think I'll go into reading it and then I'll continue talking a little bit about it after I've read the, the story. So I'm going to share my screen now. And I think you should be able to see that. Great, okay, so tomatoes in my lunchbox. I don't recognize my name at roll call the first time. The teacher says it like it's too hard to understand. Then she says it again, one syllable at a time. It's strange and sharp and sounds like something is breaking. Then children in my class say my name. And it's like it doesn't fit in their mouths. It sounds like a question every time. When my mama says my name, it's soft. Sorry, I can't see it. Soft like summer and round with love and color and light. Sorry, I just need to move this box out of the way. Right, there we go. I want to be Olivia, Sophie or Chloe, or Emma with yellow hair like the sun and the blue sky in her eyes. Any other name that is an answer. They can laugh and dance and everyone understands their names. Oh, we go. My mama tells me my, my name is beautiful and it's different but it's not beautiful here and I don't want to be different. I want a name that fits inside the front of my book. I want a name I say once and people know it's a name. I want a name that stories are about. When we came here, we left the place where, where my name fit. We took what we could and closed it in our suitcases. Our things look weird here. My clothes are weird here. The whole tomato in my lunchbox is weird here. 
I bite into it and the inside spurt out. It tastes like home. But I have to spend the rest of the day with those stains on my shirt. Mama tells me I just need to make some new friends, that's all. But I don't know how. I pick an Emma and I try to be like her. I go where she goes. I do what she does. I say what she says. It doesn't work. If my name were Emma too, we'd have something to smile to each other about and we could share secrets. But I'm not an Emma. It doesn't fit me. There is a whole world in my name. I carry it with me. It's heavy carrying your whole world around with you all the time. Grandma says a smile can lighten a heavy load. I smile at Chloe. I want to smile a big sunshiny smile, but it ends up being small. Chloe asks, where's your name from anyway? I shrug and say, it was my grandmother's name. But my voice wobbles a bit, so I don't say much more. I don't tell her it belonged to the person I loved most, the person I left behind in a place that shines with yellow sun and with blue, blue skies, the place where our names are familiar and beautiful. The memory makes my smile big and sunshiny though. Chloe nods and smiles back. The following day, I sit next to her in class. She doesn't speak during the lesson, but when it's time to leave, she points at my scarf and says, Yellow is my favourite colour. I whisper, it's my favourite colour too. I've never told anyone here that before. I wear yellow all the time after that. So does she. On the day she forgets her lunch, I offer her mine to share. She smiles and takes it like I'm giving her a gift. We sit with tomato seeds on our shirts and talk and talk, and it's like a door opening. We laugh and dance under the shining sun and skies so blue. Later, we say hello to Olivia and Sophie. Chloe tells us a story and my name is in it. It sounds soft and round and full of color as she says it with pride. My friends say it again in turns and my name is not a question anymore. It is familiar and gentle and beautiful. It is all in one piece and it sounds like home. Okay, so that's, that's the story. Um, actually felt a little bit emotional reading that for the first time um, live. Uh, as you can probably tell, it's quite a, it's a personal story. As I said before, it comes from my own experiences, but it's also layered with the experiences of, of the people around me and possibly layered with experiences maybe that some of you have had before with feeling different. Maybe your name is slightly difficult to pronounce. Maybe you've had an experience where maybe you're wearing something that is different to other people or something in your lunch box is different to what other people have. Um, I think we all have something that we feel makes us unique but also maybe separates us from other people and that's essentially what this story is about um so i'd like to start by asking magdalena a question um i've talked a little bit about how the story relates to me personally uh i'd like to ask you what it was that drew you to the story and if there are any connections that you made with it yeah well First off, thank you so much for reading. It's I think it's the first time I've also heard it read by you. Um, and it was it's just, yeah, you you feel like the the power of the words and the language um, when I hear you reading it. Um, but I think that was kind of what what struck me most about the manuscript was just um, was just how it was written and the poetry. Like it felt like, you know, the manuscript felt like this long extended poem with just such beautiful imagery. Um, and so that was kind of what initially struck me about it. But then, like you said, I think, you know, I have a name that was difficult to pronounce for a lot of people growing up. Um, and, you know, my backgrounds and my experience didn't, weren't always aligned or similar to um, what I saw in my classroom. And so I think there was also just this personal connection 
of how the story felt so familiar, you know, different experiences. Um, you know, I was in the US and uh, my family was, or my dad's side of the family is from Mexico. So different culturally different experiences, but also, you know, somewhat universal. You know, I think all kids can relate to the feeling of being new and different um, in a classroom. But then, you know, the added sort of layer of when you have a name that a lot of people can't pronounce or stumble over, or when you come to, you know, to the lunchroom with food that feels unfamiliar um, to your classmates. I think, you know, that that lunchroom setting is just anyone who's been in elementary school knows that that's like the site of so many internal dramas and struggles. Um, and uh, so, you know, the story itself also just felt particularly resonant and familiar to me too. Yeah, was there, was there a particular place that you started from when you started illustrating? Was there a particular scene or image that you had in your mind and you, you started from that point or did you start from the beginning and then just kind of work your way through? Yeah, no, um, how I typically start with illustrating picture books is I try to pick out a scene that feels the most like emotionally resonant because I feel like that can then set the, the that can set the tone for the rest of the book. And so mm -hmm. it helps for me to pick that scene that is either, you know, a pivotal turning point or um, a scene where the character is realizing something about themselves. And um, so that's where I started with the artwork for tomatoes in my lunchbox. And it was um, this scene where um, the main character is with her grandma. Um, because, you know, I think in this scene, she, the character hasn't fully realized sort of like the beauty of her name, but she's reflecting. It's, it's kind of the start of her reflecting on all of the stories that her name holds. Um, and, you know, it was, she was named after the person who she loved the most and so I thought that that felt like you know other than between that felt like the strongest personal connection um for yeah. me and I thought it would be helpful to really like develop those characters and that emotional relationship and then develop the rest of the artwork from there yeah um okay. But Cassandra, I'm. I know you talked about this a little bit in your intro, but I'm. I'm really curious just to hear more about how the idea for this story really began. Was it kind of like a whim of inspiration? Um, was it something you'd been mulling over and reflecting on for a while? Um, this this particular manuscript was an interesting one because it kind of came to me all in one go and almost all of a sudden I'd been doing a few different um, webinars and listened to other writers speak and and some general sort of kid lit learning stuff um, and somebody I can't remember who it was that said it but somebody had said oh I, there weren't many stories with my name in it when I was growing up and the person who said it had a name that was perhaps um, slightly different but when I heard that I thought gosh I've never heard a single story with my name ever at all or a story that I could sort of insert my name into so when I started thinking about this story and it kind of all just kind of came boom 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 like that um I I had my name in mind of course it comes from experience but I also wanted it to be this sort of almost blank canvas that that children could kind of apply themselves to or insert themselves into the story and this idea of um I want to name that stories are about. We don't, we often don't get that when you've got names that are unusual. I mean, I, I struggle to pronounce my own name in English. So when people ask me what my name is, I kind of have to stop and think now, do I use the Greek version? Do I use the English version? Do I use a version that somebody else can pronounce? Do I use a shorter version? Do I shorten it from the beginning or do I shorten it from the end? Or, and I go through all of this process very, very quickly um, and then sort of land on an answer. And usually it comes out and it kind of sounds a little bit weird to me as well <laughs> as the other person who's hearing it. So I had all of this in mind, but I also wanted to have more of a kind of a physical um, symbol of this difference because uh, you know an, a name is one thing and that's something that can have a story to it and a history and a culture um, in my culture in, in Cypriot culture we're named usually after grandparents as the girl is in the story so 
but my name comes from my grandfather, not my grandmother. So my grandfather's name was Costas, and uh, my name is the female version of that, Costandia. But even that itself um, is actually not quite the correct version of the Greek female version of my name. So even there, um, even in Cyprus, when I um, when I tell people my name or I write it down somewhere, even that is incorrect in Greek terms because there's a letter missing and it should be Gonstandia and it's not, it's Gostandia. And so um, it just gets more and more complicated. Um, but the symbol of the tomato was important to me because uh, I do remember being at school and having a tomato in my lunchbox. And I do remember biting into that tomato and enjoying it. Um, and it's not that anybody pointed and laughed or said anything like that, but you could still see that there were children eating bananas and apples, which are kind of more ordinary, normal um, lunchbox items. And I was holding this huge tomato that I bit into like an apple and it went all over my school uniform. And I remember going into the next lesson and sort of picking bits off and kind of looking down and, and feeling that. Um, and it's not so much that I was so bothered or upset. I wasn't upset, but it was it was something that I was well, something that I remember. So it's something that I observed as making me different from some of the other children. And I think this thing about food in particular is quite a universal difference, if that makes sense. It's a little bit of an oxymoron there saying a, a universal difference but but it is it's some it's something that represents us culturally and it's something that um particularly as you said uh, Magdalena you know, in that school lunchroom setting it, it's very very visible it's very different when you're at home and you're eating around the table with your family and you're speaking in maybe a native language or a mixture of languages and you've got all of that food on the table and you're kind of you know but when you're in that lunchroom at school and you have a, a very sort of westernized let's say lunchbox and the contents that are in it are very different to the contents that are in somebody else's lunchbox that's when you kind of start to to look and think about those differences mm -hmm. yeah. and so the lunchroom scene was kind of taken directly from your personal experiences were there any yeah. i mean it sounds like the general like the story in general was you know drawn on your lived experiences but were there any other yeah. things that you kind of yeah that you you took directly from your childhood or from things you observed and put into the story yeah well i mean when you're writing a story you kind of um this was obviously drawn from personal experience but the character in the story is not me she's not a mini me she is kind of parts of me and I hope she's parts of you as well and I'm going to ask you about that in a minute Maggie um you know and, and she sort of becomes this person of her own um and so that, yeah those those experiences are personal but I always I also thought about because I'm I was born in England um I didn't move to the UK as an immigrant um my parents did although my mother lived there um, she moved there when she was around the age of two. My dad moved when he was a little bit older. My mother, my mother's parents had been there before and then they'd moved back to Cyprus and then they'd gone back again. My parents moved to the UK after the war in Cyprus. I'm not sure if they were considered immigrants or refugees or um, it, it kind of all gets very complicated. And sometimes we try to define and, and categorize uh, what kind of difference somebody has and what category they go in and what kind of ethnic ethnicity they are and it's not always that clear cut you know things get complicated and, and lines get blurred and one of the things that I particularly liked about the illustrations Magdalena was the way that I felt that there was a universality to the to the character um, you can tell, I mean, from the expressions on her lovely little face, you can tell that you can, you can feel all of those emotions. But, but she's kind of, she's a little bit of me. I think she's a little bit of you. I hope she's a little bit of our readers. Um, where did you, where did you, how did you create this lovely character? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Like, well, with most of the characters that I draw in picture books, they're kind of, an amalgamation of a lot of different, you know, they're, they're kids who I grew up with or went to school with, friends. 
I think every character has a bit of yourself as an illustrator. Um, but with this story, I think this is the story that felt the most familiar to like my personal experiences. And so I think this character probably had more of me than some others, um, you know, particularly like in the expressions and the emotions that she was feeling. I think I drew a lot on those kind of personal experiences of um, feeling different in, in uh, elementary school and middle school. And, you know, I think what like part of what I loved about the story, like you said, was the universality of it and how the character wasn't named. And so that left an opportunity for a lot of different kids to insert their mm -hmm. own name into this character and into this story. Um, and I think I went back and forth with the character design of um, thinking about like how specific I should be in her, in her appearance. Um, and she actually started off more as, um, a blank canvas character like there wasn't a lot of detail to her clothing but it also felt like something was missing there um you know it felt like yeah like i didn't want her to not be named and then to also not have sort of like a strong identifying visual like a uh, visual characteristics and um so i think that's when i started looking up textiles from cyprus and that I felt like added to her sense of individuality. You know, the textiles mm -hmm. were just so beautiful and so fun to illustrate um, and to create different variations of. But I also felt like it was really important to, you know, this character, she, she isn't a blank canvas. Like she had so much, like so much of her story um, is in her name. And, and so I think, you know, while I was developing the character, I really wanted to, um, have her stand in for a lot of kids, but also have her own sense of indiv individuality and culture, mm -hmm. um, even if it wasn't like explicitly defined. Yeah, I think you did that very beautifully, I have to say. And I, I the other thing that I particularly liked about the illustrations is it's kind of sweeping, dreamlike, you know, in the in the sort of movement and the colors of the of the illustrations. Could you maybe tell us a little bit more about that? Maybe about the technique, maybe about some of the um, mediums that you used? I yeah. don't know if you wanted to do it. Were you gonna do a, a little demonstration as well, maybe? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Let, let me just put you on the spot there. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I don't know if I'll have time to do a full demo, but I can show you some of the materials that I used and how I, Wonderful. Use, them, how I use them. But I think with each picture book, I try to, like I, I like to work in a lot of different materials, um, you know, colored pencils, um, sometimes crayons, gouache, which is like a, a water-based um, paint um, that you can layer that you can look like watercolor or it can look like acrylic paints, um, watercolors, inks. So I kind of, you know, have a wide swath of materials that I work from, but I try to um, narrow them down depending on the book. And with this book in particular, there's so much imagery of one tomatoes um and then water like you said you know there was even in the text you can feel this sort of like sense of movement and water throughout it um and fluidity and so you know i think a natural choice was to use watercolors but then watercolors didn't quite have the punch that i was looking for for the tomatoes you know i really like the tomatoes are such this important symbol and so being able to get their color right, to get that vibrancy, um, I really relied on um, inks. So these are like pen inks that you would refill pens, but they have this really like saturated deep color. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of the tomatoes in the book, they're not just red or light red, you know, they're shades of purple and some green and some, um, oranges and deep, deep reds, and then lighter reddish pinks. Um, and so I really wanted, I, I used ink as a way to sort of bring out the, the, the colors in those tomatoes. And then um, with each book, I also like to incorporate some sort of, or try at least to incorporate a new technique. And so with this one, I did some um, printmaking. Um, so this is um, one of the blocks I, used um, a linoleum block. This is a plain linoleum block and then you carve into it to create shapes. Um, and this, you know, I think there are moments in the book where you wanted the tomato 
to be present on the page, but you didn't want it to be sort of like the overwhelming front and center image. I used it a lot in backgrounds. And so um, to create those sort of like background tomatoes, I thought that printmaking could give like, you know, a good shape that I could then insert like behind a character um, or as like part of the sky. So yeah, I think those were, those were two, you know, there were a couple other mediums. Um, but yeah, I think really like just the, in, I really wanted to pay attention and, or put a lot of intention into color choices. And so mm. um, that more than anything to capture like the blue of the Mediterranean and those, you know, those reds of the, of the tomato that sort of um, helped me decide on, on materials more than anything else. Um, but I, I'm always curious, um, asking authors this question, but I, well, one, I'm just curious if you had a favorite line, like if you had a line similar to, I have, you know, my favorite illustration in the book <laughs> that I started off with, did you have a favorite line that, or part of the story was read that you're like, oh, this really, you know, captures the book. Um, um very difficult for me to to sort of pinpoint one specific line because when I write I tend to um, try and sort of thread things together so this idea of um, the tomato tasting like home the idea of her her name sounding like home um, the feeling of the, the the sound of her her name sort of breaking and the softness of the way that her mother says it um, and the difference, the different sort of sounds. So um, I don't think I can pick like a single, a single line, but that kind of thread through the story with the, the sounds and the tastes and the way that they come through and they kind of um, link in with, with the, the character's identity. Um, I think they're sort of my favorite parts and they're the parts that I really try to work on and really try to connect and when I when I finish a manuscript and I'm sort of revising and redrafting, they're the bits that I kind of check to make sure that there's there's that sort of continuity in there and that there's almost like a almost circular um, structure to it. So it kind of comes around back to the beginning and the idea of the sounds and the and the way that they link in and the way that they feel. So I, I can't pick one. <laughs> no, I yeah, I thought <laughs> that I feel like that's a question for yeah. artists. <laughs> <laughs> answer than for illustrators but yeah mm -hmm. like I said I think that was part of what drew me to the story too was just um I mean one I just loved and I think you know it, it took me a couple of reads through to to really recognize like the beautiful sort of like repetition and circular nature of the mm -hmm. story how you know the um the main character begins the story wishing that she had or like that recognizing that she didn't see any books with a name in it that sounded like her and then it ending in this scene where she's you know surrounded by her new friends and chloe mm -hmm. her new friend is telling the other um the other friends about that she's telling a story a new story yeah that and that's kind of the central idea there you know this idea of um i want um i want a name that stories are about and then at the end of the story you've got the girls telling their stories and her name is in it. And what, what ends up being created is, I hope, a book that's a story about anyone's name, really, anyone who has a name that they don't feel like fits in anywhere else. So you sort of get that circularity again with the, with the intention and that kind of almost the heart of the book, you know, the, the, a name that stories are about. And then you end up with this book that's about a name. Yeah. Well, I, um, I think that's probably a good point to yeah. take some questions, Michelle. Yeah. Sounds good. No, thank you both for diving into the process there. It was wonderful to hear about the book and uh, both the creativity and just um, the sweet story behind it. And I think a lot of kiddos will really enjoy. So now it is time for questions. Um, if you haven't already asked a question, you can go ahead and add one um, by clicking Q&A at the bottom of your screen. 
and we'll go through as many as we have time for today. Um, also want to mention if you are having any trouble um, getting into Zoom, we did see that there may be some unforeseen tech issues. So our apologies if there's any trouble there. We are um, recording the event and we'll be sending that out. Um, so if you didn't see the whole thing, we're happy to get that to you. All righty. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start with a few of uh, my <laughs> questions and we'll uh, see if uh, we have some more. And you both actually touched on several of them, but in terms of our students um, that may be joining us, do you either of you have advice um, for students that may want to become authors one day or illustrators or um, just things they can do at home or what that um, path may look like? Okay, I'll stop. Um, advice. I think for me at least, writing is a is a, a kind of a way of making sense of the world and it's something that I've always done in one way or another maybe not in the kind of in the deliberate way that I'm writing now but it, it's kind of always been a part of my life and I've always found that I don't know if any of you have this but when I'm living my life and I'm out there and I'm doing things and whatever I almost have like an internal monologue going on and that I feel like is my writer's voice so I will make notes, you know, wherever I go and I will write things down and then I'll come back later and I'll think about them. And that writing process is my way of sort of making sense of the world, which is also why I'm kind of revisiting some of my own experiences as a child and including those or, or turning them into stories that I hope appeal to um, other young people. So in terms of advice, I think it would just be to kind of, you know, just write things down, write things down and you never know where a story may be in all of that stuff that you have, it may just be a little tiny seed and it may take years to develop into something or it may be something of its own already. But if you just write those things down, you never know what might come out of those pages. Very true. Yeah, and for those who are interested in being an illustrator, I think that is also so important. You know, I, I kept a diary as, kid, as a kid. And so um, sometimes I go back to those or when I'm, stumped for uh you know when I'm doing my own personal work and stumped for like what to draw um I've gotten into a writing practice of just writing down um like a moment from childhood and then you can illustrate that and so I think you know those are especially that's an especially important piece of advice if you're interested in children's books but then I also think if you just want to make art or draw in any capacity I think it's always important to keep to just play and to continue to play, and, um, to not be afraid to, to be bad at something. Like if you love it, you know, you'll get to a point where you eventually feel really like proud of your artwork. But um, the most important part is just to, to have fun making in during the process of making art. Definitely, thank you. Well said, both of you. Um, let's see, so we have a question from John. Um, John asks, what are you each working on next? I'll let you start this time, Maggie. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so I actually, I have another book coming out next week, um, next Tuesday, The Notebook Keeper, um, written by Stefan Briseño. Um, and then I have another book, um, Still Dreaming, coming out at the end of the year. Um, and I'm working on two other books that I'm not entirely sure how much I can talk about yet. Um, but I, I'm also just trying to um, really keep my personal practice um, going and trying new techniques. Um, I'm taking, uh, I, or I'm gonna take a printmaking class in the fall and just, um, like I said, continue to, to play without sort of any um, end goal in mind. So, yeah. Cool. Um, I have another book coming out with uh, Roaring Book Press. Um, I'm not sure when it will be out, but this one is more, actually this one is more specific, but also hopefully a little bit universal too. This one is about Cyprus and the conflict um, that we've been living with for the last, well, I, I'd, I'd say 48 years, but 48 years is kind of the sort of benchmark, but it kind of goes way back. So. Um, Cyprus is a divided island. We have the only divided capital, I believe, 
in the world and it's separated by a green line um, and the Turkish Cypriots live in the north and the Greek Cypriots live in the south and until a few years ago we were not even allowed to cross those borders so the next book that comes out will be based on that idea but um, from the perspective of a tree a fig tree to be more specific oh that's really yeah. Yeah. All right. Very cool. I was going to um, ask Othandia about if you wanted to share a little bit about what Cyprus is like um, mm -hmm. or in comparison to the UK or US um, and your experiences as a child there, or how your children may be um, experiencing Cyprus now. Um, if, do you want to delve into it a little bit more? or you? Yeah, I, I could say a little bit about that. I mean, I as I said before, I was born in the UK and we used to come on holiday, holiday to Cyprus. Um, when I was nine, we moved over as a family. Um, and then I moved back. Actually, I moved to the States first for university and then I went to the UK and then I came back to Cyprus and then I went back to the States and then I came back. So there's been sort of lots of back and forth. What's interesting about that kind of moving around is that even though I am 100% Cypriot, both my parents are Cypriot, um, I obviously sound quite British and um, I was born in the UK, so I, I'm British Cypriot, but I'm not really, I'm completely Cypriot. So when I'm in Cyprus, I'm kind of this British Cypriot person. When I'm in England, I'm a Cypriot person. And you kind of end up sort of straddling these two very different um, worlds. And sometimes, you know, that's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful, wonderful to have kind of that cultural experience and background on all of that mixing and sometimes it can make you feel a little bit weird and it can make you feel like you don't really quite fit in anywhere actually and just to sort of bring it back around to the book um that idea of home like what is home when I'm when I first moved to Cyprus home for me was was England and when I went back to England home for me was Cyprus and you know you could never really <laughs> decide or feel at home in either but I think ultimately I'm starting to understand that really what home is is those people who are around you and I know it might sound a little bit cheesy to say that but once you kind of find those people who are your people whether it's your family or it's friends or whoever it is that's where you start to feel um that home really is all right it's beautiful um always added experiences. Uh, switching to our artwork, um, Magdalena, um, you talk, thank you for sharing a bit about all the different mediums. And I love the idea of continuing to play. I was curious, do you have a favorite medium to work with um, when you're creating a children's book or just in general? Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is maybe gonna sound like a bit of a boring answer, but my favorite medium is truly like a pencil. Um, one, because I, I feel the most um, able to make mistakes and to erase, you know, that can be, there's a, sometimes an added pressure when you go, when you start working on final artwork and all you have is like paint and watercolor. And I think that presents like a really, um, a really exciting challenge too. Like if you make a mistake, you know, do you throw it out or do you find some way to incorporate it? into um, the final artwork. And sometimes that can create really interesting and really um, dynamic um, compositions. But, you know, I think as far as when I'm just sketching or when I'm just creating, like thinking of ideas for, um, for drawing, that's kind of where I feel like I'm in my zone. And that always happens with a pencil. I wish I were one of those illustrators who could just go directly into, you know, freehanding with paint or with markers. Um, and maybe one day I'll get to that point. But I feel like I, my head is clearest when I know that I can um, make mistakes and, and go back and change them. Well, pencil, very, very useful tool. Um, that's cool to hear. Uh, this is kind of a silly question. And sorry if you already covered it. But in the book, we talk about the favorite color being yellow and her and Chloe bond over that. I love yellow and I'm in a little bit of yellow today. Um, I was curious, does that pull from real life, Cosendia, uh, or is that um, more for a story? And do either of you have a favorite color? Well, it's interesting because my daughters who are eight and five often ask me what my favorite color is. And my answer is 
it, it changes every time they ask me and it kind of depends on the mood that I'm in and depends how I feel but yellow for me is a it's a it's a, a strong color that evokes a lot of feelings and and it's kind of a, a color that's symbolic of friendship and it's the sunshine and it's brightness and it's happiness and it's all these wonderful sort of warm things so for the story it was the for me at least I thought it was the perfect um color for them to bond over and to kind of start that friendship beautiful <laughs> yeah. and um I I love yellow as well but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think um, it's funny, I never really have like a great answer to that question because similarly, it just kind of changes depending on the season, depending, you know, what I'm wearing or if I've just seen a mm -hmm. color. Um, but I think, you know, whenever I work on artwork, I always like somehow incorporate like lavender or some variation of pink into it. And mm -hmm. so maybe that might unintentionally be sort of my, the color that I always kind of fall back on. And I think there's something about like the soothing quality of it, but then it can also be vibrant compared, you know, when you use it with other colors. Um, yeah. No, that was fun to hear about. Um, and you keep, well, the sunshiny aspect, I feel like comes up a few times in the book with feeling warm and feeling welcome. And then yes, that plays beautifully into the color yellow. So. Mm -hmm all lovely and I yeah I hate to be copycat too but I also like purple so <laughs> and they, they are complementary colors so I feel like that does um work very well so we're um gonna wrap up I think in just a moment um again just wanted to mention to those that may be joining us now um we did confirm there were some zoom technical difficulties so we do apologize if you missed some of the program we're going to be sending out the link and you will be able to enjoy it later um so let's go ahead and um, finish our time out today, just coming back to the book and um, process and everything. Um, it could be about this book or it could be about a future project, but do you either have a favorite part about creating a book or is there also a harder part um, when you look back on these experiences? What do you enjoy doing? Do you have a favorite part and is there anything that is a little bit trickier? Um, I find that, I mean, as I said before, that kind of idea of just writing things down and, and constantly writing things and having that process in my mind always is it's it's useful. Um, when I have a blank page in front of me and there is nothing on it, it's terrifying. <laughs> um, so for me, it's important to just kind of get everything on the page, chuck it on there, it doesn't matter how rubbish it is, and then sort it out later. But once there's something on the page and I can sort of see a little glimmer there and I start to pick at that, that's the part that I really love. Like I can feel, I can feel something happening there and it sort of starts to shape up and turn into a thing, which may be a thing that's publishable or maybe a thing that is not publishable at all, but it's a thing. Once it becomes a thing, then I feel good about it. Cool. Thank you, Lena. Yeah, my favorite part of the process is also the most challenging. So it starts off as my favorite and then <laughs> becomes not so much. <laughs> um, but I love the initial phase of developing sketches. I think that is, again, it's the most challenging. You know, you're just given the manuscript and usually you're not given a lot of direction, which I think a lot of illustrators like myself really enjoy. You're just kind of handed it and, um, you know, in the in the sketching phase, you that's where you're starting to think about like how you can also help tell the story. Um, you know, like in the case of Tomatoes in My Lunchbox, the most challenging part was developing um, the character's backstory and how much I really wanted to get into that. Um, and that all happened in the sketch phase. And so there's, there's a lot of excitement around that and it's um, kind of like pulling teeth sometimes, but um, it feels, you know, like writing with pictures. That's neat to hear. Yep. Okay. So enjoyable, but also difficult and rewarding, <laughs> I'm sure. So we do, um, I was going to, we were going to finish our time, but I do see because of the tech issues, we do have a later question. So I do want to get to that from the audience if um, that both works, if that works for the both of you. Arini, um, apologies if I mispronounced that, um, has a question. Um, more when you first read the book, how were you inspired? So if either, if both of you want to talk a little bit, um, I know you've 
covered it some, but if you want to just close out with any last thoughts on inspiration for this story, um, we'll do that. Yeah, well, um, yeah, as I said earlier, there was just so much beautiful language to work off of. And there were, um, you know, I think that the manuscript was like a dream manuscript for an illustrator because there were these images that you could latch onto, like, like, we, like the tomato, like the water, like the color yellow. They were kind of like these guideposts for how you might illustrate the story, how might you might use color and symbolism and imagery. Um, but it also left so much room open for the illustrator to help tell that story. And I think that's kind of like the perfect balance of a children's book manuscript is, you know, you're providing maybe like a map, but you haven't fleshed out all of the key points and details along the way. And so, um, yeah, I, I think initially I just latched on to like the, the image of the tomato too, and sort of how, um, you know, Costanzia was talking about it is this, you know, one, it's just like a really fun, beautiful um, image to try to illustrate. And there's so much variation in how you can play with it. But then also it is like a representation of difference and, and of the character's um, story and her connection to home. So a lot to work off of. <laughs> yeah. Cassandra, any last thoughts or your inspiration or final takeaways you'd like to leave viewers with? Um, for me, it's interesting to hear Magdalena talking about that process and the things that she picked out from the manuscript because that's, you know, it, that that's kind of my job. So to hear hear that I've done that well and I've kind of planted those symbols there and I've given you that space to to produce something which I think we can all agree, agree is very beautiful. I mean, it's the, the illustrations are they're just gorgeous. Um, that that has now given me inspiration to sort of you know continue and to and to move on for this particular one as I said those kind of those signposts the tomato the name um hearing about other people's experiences of not being represented in stories all of that kind of um melded together that that's what gave me the inspiration for the book lovely though well said thank you for sharing um thank you viewers for your questions thank you both uh for joining us today and uh, um okay <laughs> one more i'm sorry i'm just going to get to these um, <laughs> this is very timely though so did the um paul paula does ask did the pandemic bring any challenges to the process of working on the book and its publication so i'm sure it probably did if you want to touch on that <laughs> real quick that um really will be our last question <laughs> yeah uh for me the i mean the manuscript was almost it was quite polished it was almost complete um when it was acquired so there were some tweaks that needed to be um needed to be made as we went along but it, there were kind of minor things and things to just sort of make sure that they were linking in and tying in with the the flow of the story and the illustrations and so on and so forth what was tricky with the pandemic is that everything slowed right down all the way down and so you know it just took a long time for things to, I mean, things were moving, but, you know, it took a long time for things to move. And of course, when you are um, isolating or you're in lockdown or whatever else, and you're also at home and you're having meetings on Zoom, much like we are now, and then you've got little ones coming in and asking for things, and then you can't get work done, and all of that kind of chaos um, also added to that, the interruptions, the chaos, the, the slowing down, and the, the whole kind of pandemic, which I'm sure many people also experienced. Maggie, what was your experience? Yeah, I think it was probably harder for authors because, you know, you write this manuscript and then you send it off and, you know, for an illustrator, there's about a year in between the time you submit mm -hmm. final work and then, yeah, like maybe like eight months to a year in between the time you hand in final artwork and you see it as a book. And so there's already sort of like a glacial pace to publishing and a lot of waiting and patience baked into the process. But I think, you know, the pandemic just kind of lengthened that and amplified that. And you had to have even more reserves of patience to, um, mm. to get through. And, you know, I think as an illustrator too, I at least 
personally take, get a lot of inspiration from being out in the world and traveling and seeing friends and being in coffee shops and people watching. Um, and so I think, you know, there were, there were points in the pandemic, not necessarily with this book, um, but there were other points with other illustration work that I was like, oh man, I, I have nothing to like fill my well or to draw from. Um, but, you know, thankfully kind of got over the, that hump. And I think having um, things go helps, yeah. And also uh, just to say that this, I mean, this book really kind of is a pandemic book because it, it was acquired in towards the end of 19, beginning of 20, then the pandemic hit and it's coming out now where hopefully we're kind of coming out of the pandemic and, and things hopefully are ending. So it's really been sort of that in between period where all of this stuff was happening and, and been, being put together, lots happening behind the scenes. Definitely. No, we're so glad that you both persevered, had all that patience, and it's a beautiful, beautiful um, product at the end of the journey here. Um, so again, want to remind viewers, there is a link in the chat box, so be sure to reserve your copy today. Again, thanks for joining us. Um, thank you, Kosandia and Magdalena, for joining us. We were so excited to have you. And there are signed book plates from the author while supplies last. So we are excited to include those. And as an independent bookstore, we always do appreciate your support. Um, viewers, be sure to check out our website for updated event listings, and you can follow our children and teen department on social media under at Kids and Pros. And that about wraps up our time this morning. Uh, thank you again for joining us. We'll get that link out, and we wish you a great day. Tomatoes in my lunchbox. Thank you all. Well, thank you.